Welcome to OCP 101. We're going to spend the next 60 to 80 minutes talking about what is the Open Compute Project and how your organization can consume, collaborate, and contribute with us in this open hardware environment. First off, I'd like to thank Intel Corporation for allowing us to the use of their video studios today and, uh, in, and the use of this facility. So uh, this is Bill Carter. I'm actually uh, great to be back at Intel. Uh, I worked here for 33 years doing various design uh, program management and product management functions for the company and uh, got involved in a lot of uh, open hardware designs and uh, energy efficiency, uh, cloud efficiency projects uh, while I was here. Uh, since that time, I've had an opportunity to work with the Open Compute Project Foundation. Uh, both as a liaison uh, while I was employed at Intel and now as a the chief technology officer for the foundation. Very happy to be here and have a chance to talk to you about OCP 101. And I'm Amber Grainer. I'm the operations director and community manager for the Open Compute Foundation. I've been with the foundation now almost four years and it's been an exciting time. And so again, as, as Bill mentioned, we want to thank Intel Corporation for our, the opportunity to be here today. And it's, it's always exciting when people from the community um, get involved in, in, in a project and, and we're always excited to have those community members who come on as employees. And so Bill, um, we are very thankful that you're now with us and you're our CTO. And, thank you. And that you're presenting with me today. This would be, uh, uh, I think this would be a scary proposition to, to sit here in front of the cameras and the lights without someone um, here with me. So thank you so much for being You're welcome. here. You're welcome. You're welcome. So without further ado, let's talk about what is OCP. So we're a we're a nonprofit. We're a 501c6 organization. Um, we were founded in Delaware. We were fun founded in 2011 by Facebook, Rackspace, and Intel. We now have over 180 members, and we're growing every day. Currently, we have five board member companies. We have Facebook, Rackspace, Intel, Microsoft, and Goldman Sachs. We have 140 plus IP contributions that have been accepted to date. So from 2011 to 2017, over 140 IP contributions. We, those contributions come from 22 different companies um, that represents more than 170 products. And those products uh, scan from both, you know, they scan the gamut of both Greenfield and Brownfield solutions. So those who think that we're only about Greenfield, you should probably take a look at the website um, and check out uh, these contributions that we have. We're also uh, technology focused. We're driven by the, you know, we're, we're as an organization, we, are, we do have a focus on the technology. The board defines our scope, but the community itself really defines the technologies. We don't try to be all things to all people. We really um, want to focus on the data center, though that ecosystem in, near, and around the data center. Bill, do you have anything to add to what I we are? I think you said it well. Uh, we are a very community-driven organization, and although we have traditionally focused on the data center and what goes in it in terms of you know operating a cloud efficiently. Uh, our members are, are pushing us and, and we're starting to kind of branch out in terms of wireless and network capability and, and spanning out into you know some of the kind of remote data centers and particularly central offices um, in the telecommunications industry. It's very exciting to see what our network group has done over the last three years and now what the telco group it is has. doing and now um, you know what storage is going to be yep. be doing going yep. on. So where where were we yesterday? Where are we at today? What are we looking at for tomorrow? You know, we initially uh, the initial focus leveraged Facebook designs. They were you know the idea of open compute was really born out of Facebook. And then as I mentioned in 2011, Facebook, Intel, and Rackspace came together to found the foundation. And then um, you know so, and, and Facebook gave the first designs and gave those first contributions. But since then, as you can see, 22 companies. So we have it's enabled those board member companies such as Goldman Sachs and, and Rackspace and others to leverage those designs to implement um, in their existing data centers. And those existing data centers were Brownfield, not Greenfield. At first, you know, Facebook was the only Greenfield one that we saw um, really adopting um, open compute. And that gave them access to technologies before they before they could ever have it. Um, before us, you know, they'd have to wait. But now, um, because of people releasing those designs early and getting, you know, the spec 
specs and designs out there, people now have ac access to it sooner than they would without Open Compute. We also have a robust community um, that is, uh, you know, our, our community structure is a little different. Um, we are a merit-based community. We have currently, believe it or not, more than 4,000 engineers um, that are involved in the nine different projects that we have. We also, in addition to our projects, we have our incubation committee. The innovation that we see, um, you know, increased and, and the focus shifted to the, the value add design element. More than just the paper specifications, it was why the designs were important and why pairing the specifications with the designs were important. We also apply open source principles and philosophy that were typically associated with software. We applied those to the hardware environment. Um, and so we kind of challenged uh, what, uh, you know, what was the typical way to go to market w with designs and, and, and implementing hardware designs. We, we now uh, did that, we're now seeing what folks do in the software world, we're doing in the hardware world. We're expanding into markets beyond hyperscale, as Bill had mentioned. Um, you know, beyond it where IT is a core business, you know, we're seeing it in the financial industry, we're seeing it in the telco industry, the hosting markets. You know, we're broadening solutions to address the needs of these markets, but as the community, as Bill mentioned, the community really drives what we're doing and, and where we're going, and we will broaden our focus and broaden the solutions that we work with the community to bring based on what our community's needs are. We're also in establishing an adoption ecosystem um, make, to make it better uh, or easier to deploy and adopt open compute solutions. But what are we looking at um, for the future? Well, a couple things that we're looking at were our increased emphasis is on integration of both software and hardware to create a more complete ecosystem. And the emphasis is on growth in both the innovation and adoption. You know, just to have innovation um, for the sake of innovation if nobody's adopting it, it's kind of nice. It's kind of like a great hacker space, but if nobody's adopting it, why do it? And then on the adoption side too, if we're not constantly reinventing the wheel or making, you know, the better data center, making, you know, things more efficient, you know, so th those hand, the innovation and the adoption go hand in hand. We're also seeing a continued e emphasis on growing and retaining a strong community presence. Um, and so you can see where we were, where we're at today, and where we're going tomorrow. Bill, do you have anything to add to, to this? Nope. Good job. So our future initiatives, and I'm going to let Bill speak to these future initiatives because he's really driving a lot of this along with Steve Helvey, who's our uh, VP of Channel. And so these future initiatives, along with our growing community, um, you know, we have to have, you know, strong orderable SKUs and sources, and, and Bill's working heavily on that side of it. So, Bill, I'll let you talk about this. Yeah, real, of it. real briefly, uh, we, we started uh, in Q4 of, of 2016 putting together a list of of orderable SKUs and the uh, supply uh, supplier network that you can get those from. Uh, we're actually porting those over to a portal on the Open Compute webpage that allow our community to to search for the uh, SKUs that are available today and and identify uh, contacts and sources they can buy those from. We're starting to work on uh, on developing uh, information about the 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 product that was validated the commodities that were validated with us. For example, what DIMMs were used, what hard drives were used, what PCIe adding cards were used when they did those initial uh, test configurations and follow-on tests that may have performed uh, by the channel or the, the supplier network. So our plan is to make all of that information available and make open hardware easy to consume um, by this community. We also began talks with the uh, software uh, suppliers and we have a tremendous interest from the software community uh, to take their software stack, uh, particularly their operating systems and, and, and in the future the entire software stack and build reference architectures that we can then share with our community and that they can support on open, open hardware. Uh, the software, the open hardware community has been very active for years. We've now given them a platform to to put their software on that's also an open platform. Uh, we're, we're working with our supplier network to put together validation processes and really we don't we're, we're not a community that will define 
how they validate and test. We have 4,000 engineers that know how to do that very, very well. What we want to do is provide a library of information that we can share with our community. And we're putting that in, in place in 2017. Uh, and building the ecosystem around that. Again, focusing on making sure that we, we are embracing new technologies and allowing our community to adopt that new technology as quickly as possible. So, um, we have a, a, a very good uh, network of software partners today that'll allow us to complete that, that solution stack. And we actually have some test labs uh, that we've been using for a couple of years. Uh, one being the University of New Hampshire and the focus on network testing and the network uh, OS, the network stack. And we're going to uh, uh, really exploit that capability and nurture that and, and uh, continue to build upon that capability as well as capability that we have with the solution providers, uh, both U.S. And, and overseas, to enable uh, a robust uh, solution built with open hardware from OCP and the software from these third-party suppliers. I think our future, um, I was going to be kind of corny and say our future's so bright we've got to wear shades. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel like that. It, it, it does. When you think about where we were, you know, three and a half, four years ago to where we are today, you know, you, you can see. It's very exciting. So how, how did it all begin? As I mentioned, um, in 2011, we, um, you know, we were incorporated. But it all actually began in 2009 when Facebook, you know, wanted to, um, they were offering new services and, and they were really looking for a new way to do things. They wanted to be more energy efficient and they wanted to be, um, wanted to lower the PUEs and, and with their data centers. And so it started with Primeville, Oregon, and then you what, had Forest City, North Carolina, and then what we have, Lulia. Um, and, and other data centers that they've put together. But in 2009 is when they really started looking at how, do, how can they be vanity free and, and remove anything off the, those racks that didn't need to be there and thus making them more energy efficient. That's when they moved to the, the bus bar. Um, I think back in those days, back in 2009, it was the V1 rack with three bus bars and now we're at V2 with the single bus bar. And so we've seen all this innovation that's been happening since, since the beginning. And thankfully Facebook said, hey, we want to give this to the world. And thus in 2011 is when we were incorporated. So it all began with an idea at Facebook in 2009. In the open source world, we often say we stand on the shoulders of giants. And while we do apply the principles and philosophies that are associated with open source software, thus we're standing on you know, those, the shoulders of giants such as uh, Linus Torvalds and, and Richard Stallman, we're also standing on the shoulders of giants that include Facebook because without their willingness to open up their designs and be the first contributors, um, we wouldn't have the Open Compute Project Foundation today. So that's, that's a little bit of our history and how it all began. So the OCP organization. You can see in this slide, everybody in green is an OCP employee. Everybody in gray is a volunteer. The blue box is cell support that is represented by some of our member companies. And those who are interested in, in the sales piece of it can contact Steve Helvey um, for more information. But you can see the foundation is as lean. I often say our foundation operates as lean and efficiently as our racks do. Uh, meaning that we may have a small team of people, but we work as we mentioned, with over 4,000 engineers in our community. Our board, our incubation committee, and our, and our project leads are all volunteers. The incubation committee and the project leads are voted in, um, so the community votes those positions in, with the exception of the chair and vice chair of the IC. Those are appointed by the board. You can see that um, we have a rich and deep knowledge um, of the industry. When you look at the companies that each of our um, board members represent, our incubation committee members represent, and our project leads represent. When you look at the incubation committee, let's, let's talk about that for just a moment. That's the committee that decides on whether um, a contribution, whether it's a specification or a design, um, gets accepted uh, into the foundation. Bill, um, we're going to get to a little bit more in detail about the IC uh, on another slide, but that's the committee that Bill sat on for years and, and helped uh, lead and and drive uh, a lot of what got accepted. Yeah, think of the think of the IC or the incubation committee as the technical steering committee for the Open Compute Project. 
they oversee the work that goes on in all the, the, the nine uh, projects. They provide the guidance and the leadership to the co-project leads of those projects. They provide continuity as the, co as the co project leads are re-elected on a, a yearly basis. And, uh, and they also then uh, nurture uh, contributions and uh, design packages that are being contributed to the, to the foundation. They help the projects nurture those through the process and eventually uh, bring those forth to their peer group uh, for, for consideration and adoption uh, by the foundation. So I mentioned earlier too that our model was a little bit different and that um, unlike most foundations or, or most uh, uh, nonprofits that you see in, in the open source community, um, we, all, we do have these elected models and you can't, you can't buy a board seat, you can't buy a leadership position. Um, you've got to be active in contributing um, and be a member in order to sit on, on you know, in, in these leadership positions. And so we, we look at both the merit and the money. It's not one or the other, it's a combination of, of time, money, and IP. And we'll get a little bit more in detail with that on some of the next slides. But as, as you can see, we do have co-CEOs at the moment, Corey Bell and Rocky Bullock. Have myself as the operations director and community manager. Have Michael Shield, who's our community support specialist. Steve Helvey is our VP of channel development. So if you're wanting to know what products to buy or you want to be, you know, and you have OCP products, Steve's going to be the one that you want to talk to. John LeBan is our European representative. Again, we have the sales support team, which is made up of other member companies who are selling um, open compute gear and helping us um, make adoption easier. Bill, we have you now as our CTO. We have Dirk Van Slyke as our marketing and communications director. We have Stephanie Loiza as our events manager. So we have a, a multi-talented team that we work with, and uh, it's, it's very exciting to be part of this today. Anything you want to say about our model here? So what are the keys to success? I often talk about communication, 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 but what is it about communication and participation that is so unique and special in this? It's the transparency. As we mentioned, we're an open and collaborative community, which means um, you have to be transparent. You've got to participate on the mailing list. We don't create little cliques where a group in California meets and leaves out a group in Europe or leaves out a group on the East Coast. Everybody communicates first and foremost across our mailing list. And what this does is, is it creates that transparent communication because chances are if you have a question, somebody else on that list has a question as well. And what that does is it, it, it's critical that everybody communicate um, together to you know, to have successful participation, but that open and transparent communication also builds trust, kind of puts everybody on the same level. I'm not going to read this particular slide, but I will point out some of the benefits to communicating. You have better insight and awareness into the community. By attending um, OCP events and engaging online, you place yourself and other organizations in a position to understand and leverage the solutions that we have. You also have a better sense of how you um, can leverage the, that knowledge for your organization um, and you personally. You know, once you once you do communicate or once you do participate in, in the community, you're also capable of executing to your goals faster and more efficiently. Uh, imagine when you first get to know some you know a project or get to know someone. You're still kind of you know, figuring out what works and what doesn't work. But, but once you participate, once you get to know the project and the project leads and the people who you're engaging with, it goes a lot faster. You know, and human nature being what it is, if someone knows you and someone knows your organization and knows you're participating and you're trying and, and you're really wanting to get the most out of your membership or your participation, chances are when you ask a question, you're going to get help a little faster um, than someone who, um, you know, isn't known to the community. And that's not, that's not to say, you know, people, you'll be ignored if you're not known. That's not it at all. But just as human nature, if your friend calls you, you're going to pick up the phone. If it's an unknown number, chances are you're not going to pick up the phone. You know, you also have the ability to drive innovation and enhance the hardware and software that you rely on. And so if you're looking, you know, it used to be, and Bill 
correct me if I'm wrong here, but it used to be a vendor driven ecosystem where you as the adopter didn't have much choice. You couldn't say, I don't like that rack the way it's designed. I don't like that power shelf where it's at. I don't like these things about it. I want you to change them. But now if you're participating, you're going to have the ability to change that ecosystem and make it an adopter driven yeah. ecosystem. I've seen two benefits of this open communication and this, this uh, socialization of ideas. The first being that when you have uh, suppliers that are participating um, in this open collaboration and particularly those that are willing um, to share their specs, we may find fellow travelers. Uh, fellow travelers that will say, I really like this concept and, uh, and, and I'm willing to actually design products that may support this particular rack architecture, this storage solution, um, this compute node. Uh, they, we've seen cases where uh, suppliers that would normally be fierce, fiercely competitive with each other are actually now willing to collaborate on a standard or a specification that they can both then uh, design to. So they get early access to information, they find where they have common ground and common purpose, and they, they collaborate. The other benefit on the consumer side is we find fellow travelers that are interested in buying and consuming these products. And, and we're actually able to kind of match up the consumer with the suppliers and it creates a market for them. And now we get much more excitement from the suppliers to actually go off and build a product for that customer, knowing that they have actual customer, customer demand from customers that they may not have otherwise known about or, or, or been in contact with. So again, all because of that open community. So in order to make OCP easier to consume, again, we must collaborate and we must see contributions. So that open, I'm going to stress it over and over again, the open communication, the collaboration piece is key to driving adoption, the consumption, and the innovation, the contribution piece of it. You can see the board, um, our, our board of directors and the foundation staff are very closely aligned and communicate almost daily um, at some level. And then we communicate out to the community, which first begins with the incubation committees and the projects, which are both very closely aligned. And then they communicate out to the greater community, and that community in, in, uh, it has the ability to communicate back. And so it's this great circle. If you look at the logo, which I believe is on this slide, the logo of the arrows, the arrows going out, the arrows going in, and the arrows going around. That represents the ideas coming in, the ideas flowing out, and those ideas being incubated um, and consumed um, within our ecosystem. So community empowers people. Community, the community piece of this is meant to empower those who are participating, those who are communicating. So we want um, the OCP community to be um, empowered to drive open hardware into all these various industries such as telco, financial, enterprise, and more. However, in order to do so, our members and our participants have to participate in the projects and be part of the team. And to be part of the team, you got to consume and you got to collaborate. And how would they uh, collaborate? Do we have a slide in there on that? No, we, we don't. Well, we do, <laughs> sort of. Well, we do. We do. We have the, the lattice where, where okay, the good. projects cross over. So here's, as I mentioned, you, the IC and the project leads are very closely aligned. For each of our projects that we have, the nine top-level ones, uh, we have uh, certification interoperability, data center, hardware management, HPC, networking, open rack, server, storage, and telco. I need to point out two of these will be changing and by the time we roll into the 2017 summit it's going to be uh, um, compliance and interoperability and open rack will be rack and power. That's right. So, but for each of these top level projects you'll see that we do have an IC representative and we have either a project lead or co-project leads. So these two, um, these two areas of our community um, while each has a little bit different function, work very closely together. And we wouldn't be able to do what we do without these companies and these volunteers working tire tirelessly um, on those contributions and on shepherding these communities around each of these uh, top-level projects. 
Here's us talking about the collaboration piece. If you look at our community, and I don't have this turned on its side, we aren't a ladder. So don't think of the OCP community as a ladder where it's step one, step two, step three. If you turn this just a little bit, you would see that it's more like a lattice. Nothing says you have to start at the rack group or the storage group or the server group or the networking group. You could start at telco and you could go into the data center group or you and and networking server storage and rack are those four basic elements of a, a full solution and then our other five uh, technology verticals which are telco and compliance and interoperability HPC data center and hardware management kind of cross have the ability to cross every one of our technology verticals and so you could um, collaborate with the networking community and the telco community at the same time or you could be sitting somewhere between hardware management and server and you're both working on the the same um, same goals or you could see um, you know the, the telco group actually recently uh, was a rate assist with a full rack solution th that we had um, so started in the telco group but actually crossed every one of our technology verticals and so you can see that you don't have to stick to one area you can move around it you know and we areas. and we encourage that we want to make sure that the networking solutions that are being developed by the networking project and the disaggregation of the network switch is in fact used across all the verticals. And we're seeing that. We're seeing wide adoption of networking, open networking gear uh, by the telco industry as well as your traditional uh, you know, cloud service providers. Uh, same with hardware management. We want to manage the hardware the same. We want to have a universal uh, schema for managing that hardware uh, across network, server, storage, and uh, uh, rack infrastructure. And to your point, you mentioned earlier, uh, although we call it the Open Rack Group today, we are in the process of, of changing the name of that group. We recognize that, that the, uh, the rack is an ingredient. It's composed of the mechanical structure to hold the IT equipment, as well as the, the power, the centralized or shared power or power distribution scheme. And so we're renaming that group uh, Rack and Power. And that group, in fact, uh, not only supports the Open Rack spec, but supports a couple of other uh, uh, rack standards that we have adopted as a foundation that we'll talk about uh, this hour as well. As I mentioned, we have the nine top level projects and each of these groups, speaking of con uh, collaborating, each of these groups have online meetings, wiki pages, mailing lists, they have a section on um, the website. So you can interact. The first place you'd want to do, let's just say you want to get involved in the the server group. You would go um, to list.opencompute.org. You'd pick the server uh, mailing group and you would subscribe, you know, to that list. There's also wiki pages. Think of the wiki pages as the filing cabinet. This is where the technical filing cabinet for for these groups. This is where you're going to find information on the meetings. You'll find, you know, all the specs and designs. You'll find out what they're working on. This is the more detailed version of it. What's on the website is top level. Here's the scope. Here's the focus. Here's the links to the wiki pages, you know, here's the links to the event page, you know, that sort of stuff, the top level stuff. But when you want to really dig down and see what these projects are really working on, you want to go to their wiki pages. And then, of course, uh, again, the online meetings. All the groups uh, have at least one monthly meeting. If not, some actually have three and four. They have weekly meetings. And so, depending on which group you're in, it could be um, like low traffic on that mailing list and, and one, you know, one uh, meeting a month. Others, it could be high volume, and they're meeting every week. And so there's many ways to collaborate um, in our community. But the start of it all is joining that mailing list and finding out what these groups are doing. How big is the mailing list for some of these groups? Over 2,000 people. Are, like for the, for the networking group alone, I believe we're up to 23 or 2,400. Is that right? And how about servers? Servers is, I believe, we're sitting around 1,200. Wow, yeah. So. And th those are two of the big groups. They, they meet on a pretty frequent basis. Uh, routinely, you'll have uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 people that will call in. Uh, we also ask that, that any contributions begin the socialization process in this group with uh, early release uh, of, of specifications and design packages. And we ask that a contributor uh, seek the input of the community, look for those fellow travelers, those fellow collaborators, and try to uh, spec out and build a much more robust product that is much more easy uh, to adopt by the community. And so it all starts in those, in those project meetings 
and it, and on those monthly calls. So that's where you that's where you want to go for for the information, the wiki pages, and, and attending those online meetings. Again, adopting another uh, principle and philosophy from open source software: release early, release often. Yeah, that's right. Again, how to participate? Uh, you know, I, I used to just put up one slide for. You know, here's how you participate. But I think sometimes, and I know for myself especially, sometimes you have to hear it in many different ways. And so when you look at this slide on how to participate, those first four, you don't need to be a member. Remember I said we aren't, we're a little bit different model. Um, you can't buy leadership positions. We are a merit-based organization. And so you don't need to be a member to join the mailing list or add to the conversation or help, you know, drive the focus of a project. You don't you don't need to be a member to join the online project meetings and participate in the discussion and provide thought leadership. You don't even need to be a member to participate in the in-person events. Like nobody says you have to be a member to uh, come to the engineering workshops or uh, our summit or any of our OCP days or the technology days. And you know you can participate in industry events and represent your organization's interest in OCP. Now. Things that do require membership, obviously, to become an OCP member requires, you know, you to become a tiered member. To contribute hardware specifications and designs, you need to be a member and to run for a leadership position. Um, whether that's a project lead, an IC member, a regional community leader, um, you must be a member as well. So it's when you want those benefits um, of, of uh, membership that you need to become uh, a member. And we'll get into more detail on membership in just a moment. Here's some helpful links. Um, as you can see, the Get Involved page, the mailing list, how we calculate contribution credits, the wiki, the summit site, um, the events page, and our blog. Our blog is one of the places you should always bookmark, along with uh, probably the wiki for the group that you want to um, participate in, and also the summit site, because as soon as we, um, this one actually says 2016, but if you click on that, it'll route you to 2017. Um, but we, we definitely, um, as soon as we get new dates in and as soon as we start working on um, next year, matter of fact, the last day of Summit this year, you'll already see Summit 2018 stand up. So summit.opencompute.org is always uh, also a link that you might want to bookmark as well. We have a yearly summit held in the spring, usually in March, yep. usually in the Bay Area. How many people do we have attending the Any, summit? Anywhere from 2,500 to 3,000 people attend and, yearly. And we usually have to cut off the, the attendance because we, we fill the, the venue. Yep. yep. So, um, so ticket sales uh, are happening right now. Um, and, you know, we, we have a great lineup right now. And I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of this. So our regional expansion. We have three. Uh, we have three approved communities right now. We have OCP Japan, we have OCP Taiwan, and we recently stood up uh, OCP Australia New Zealand um, in February. Well, I guess end of January, first part of this month. We're working on Canada. We're working on Europe and Korea um, for the rest of this year. Think of our regional community as a user group. Those who have similar interests in and around um, open compute. So. Um, these aren't legal entities, they're more like a volunteer organization, if you will, a way of organizing folks who are interested in um, OCP in a particular region because it's always easier to get together um, with your neighbors down the street than it is somebody four states over or three countries over. And so we want to enable folks um, in particular regions um, to help drive uh, participation in open compute as well as adoption. OCP membership. So we have many ways to, to become an, an OCP member. Again, we have our community level, our silver, our gold, and our platinum level. Um, the first three levels, um, you can just write a check and become a member. Um, just like there's many ways to get to a, a particular area. For example, we were coming here today. I had to fly and then take a car. Bill only had to drive in. And so there's many ways to get to the same point. So we do have one level, which is our gold level, that will, if you aren't going to give any IP and maybe you don't have a large staff, you can just write a check and become a gold member. However, you can also give hours, you can give less money, and one IP contribution and become a gold member. Our platinum tier, which is our highest tier, 
requires 3,120 hours, requires 40K and one IP contribution in order to become platinum. Platinum, because it is our highest tier, you can't just write a check and become platinum. You've got to have, and I use this expression, you've got to have some skin in the game. You've got to have some merit. You've got to be participating in order to be um, a platinum member. And so think about when you look at this, people say, wow, the higher the tier, the less the, the money is. And that's because we expect if you're going to become platinum, you're going to be giving more hours and you're going to be giving an IP contribution. So therefore, that time and that IP or that merit and that money um, are, are equal somewhat because we need, we need the contribution piece, we need the collaboration, we need the innovation piece, but we also have to keep the lights on. And so the more merit that you have, the less money that you pay. We're, we're very excited about our platinum members. They, uh, they contribute, uh, obviously, um, some money and IP, but more importantly, they provide uh, really talented engineers that are chairing our projects and participating on the incubation committee. So we're very happy with our platinum members and the talented uh, engineering and, and, and leadership that, that they're uh, providing to the foundation. It's, it's exciting to see folks come in and maybe they'll start at a community level and then they'll realize, hey, we're giving IP and we want these other benefits. And so when you look at the other benefits that our platinum members get, for example, you're eligible to be nominated for a project lead in, a, in an IC position. Um, you can uh, vote in the project leads in the IC positions. You can um, receive a quote about your membership. Um, you can get a discount on Summit. Now, Silver, Gold, and Platinum all get some level of these benefits. Community gets a little less. Um, but when you look at these benefits, think about if you're sponsoring Summit and you're, you know, you're a platinum sponsor, which this year is 200K, um, you get 20% off that, which is 40K, which is essentially getting the cost of your tiered membership fee off in your discount on Summit. And so we, we really work to make sure that there, there are many advantages to becoming um, an OCP member. Now this chart is a little busy, but I would, I would encourage you, if you're wanting to become a member and you're not sure which way you want to go, to ask yourself a couple questions. And those questions would be, do you want to run for a leadership position? Do you want to vote in the, leader, you know, the IC election? Do you want to have a discount on Summit? And are you planning on contributing IP? So if you're going to give specifications and you're going to give a design, then you, know, you might want to look at that platinum level uh, membership. The other thing I would also ask yourself, do you have products that you want to market as open compute? If you want to become an OCP provider, whether you're providing a full rack solution, and when we mention full rack solutions, we're talking about L6 through L10, um, you know, that type of support for that full rack solution. And then we also have the component provider piece of it. So whether you're um, wanting to market a full solution or whether you're wanting to call your component open compute. If the answer is yes to any of those questions, then you might want to look, I tell people to look at the community level membership, and if that's not, that doesn't give you the benefits that you need, then definitely look at the platinum membership because you'll notice that even with our solution provider fees, community is higher, platinum is lower because the more merit that you have, the less money that you pay. It's a little confusing, but once you get your head around that merit piece and you understand um, the model that we have, it makes a lot of sense because we want to drive that open collaboration, want to drive that, that open initiative. And the way to do that is to um, really give credit to the merit piece of it, to the time piece and to the contribution piece. Anything you want to add there, Bill? Oh, you did well. So, there's PR guidelines. We ask that you give our PR team a minimum of two weeks lead time for any requests that you have. Only silver, gold, and platinum members are eligible to receive a foundation quote about membership. However, if you're contributing hardware and software, and once it's accepted, um, you know, once we've recognized it as an OCP contribution, then we'll give you a quote about your contribution, of course. Please note that the foundation, um, we get asked this a lot, and this is why I, I add this to this slide. 
we we don't give quotes about intended contributions so if you intend to give a contribution you know six months from now we we can't you know give you that quote until it actually becomes recognized and we also don't allow our members to use the OCP foundation logo because each level of membership comes with its own um, logo so community silver gold and platinum each has their own logo our solution providers have their a logo um, and then once a product is recognized as either OCP accepted or inspired which Bill will talk about here in just a few minutes um, you get a logo for that um, so if you have any questions about the PR or media guidelines or use of logos or trademarks, please email um, press at opencompute.org and they can answer all of your questions when it comes to that. It's the supporting documentation for our membership uh, agreements, which is the agreement, the tiered membership policy, our bylaws or IP policy, and our certificate of incorporation. There's a simpler link. We've made it a little bit easier. If you just go to opencompute.org um, under participate, there's the legal documents page as well. And all of these are found on the legal page um, on the website. And with that, we're getting into the specifications, the designs, and the product contribution process. And I will turn it over to you, Bill. Thank you. So uh, our designs uh, really start out as a, as a paper specification. And we do this to promote the sharing of information and, and allow uh, contributors to start that socialization uh, through the project teams. And so we ask that, that, we, uh, that we create a, a specification for the product that they, that they wish to contribute and they socialize that through uh, the, the, uh, uh, the project team. Uh, there's a few requirements uh, that, that come with that. Uh, we ask that they sign a, a CLA or contributor license agreement that opens up that, that spec uh, for the community to, to use and adopt. Uh, and we have a very simple checklist that we ask that they follow to make sure that, that the contribution is complete and they've signed the, the requisite licenses. Um, once they've done that, uh, the project team reviews that specification. Uh, if they find this, the specification satisfactory, they find that the specification meets the objectives of, the, um, of open compute um, and meets the tenets for efficiency and openness, they will make a recommendation to the incubation committee to approve that specification. The incubation committee, through a formal voting process, will uh, disposition that. Uh, and, and that disposition may in fact result in, in formal acceptance of that specification. Once we have a specification accepted, there's really two next steps. One is a product uh, that is built to that specification can be contributed uh, to the foundation uh, in the form of a design package or manufacturing package. Think of this as the board level schematics, the bill of material, the source code for any uh, firmware that, that resides on the board, uh, manufacturing Gerber files, so on and so forth. Um, they put together a, a design package and contribute that uh, to the foundation. That design package then is, can be used and adopted by uh, anyone and, uh, and ideally uh, they can evolve that package or evolve that design and ideally innovate uh, on that design and based on the terms of the license, they, they may be asked to actually contribute back um, a product that is built off of uh, that original design. Again, there's a couple of different licensing options, and that's one of the choices they make when they, uh, when they contribute a design package is uh, the license of which it, it is uh, granted to the foundation or licensed to the foundation. They also uh, have to uh, have an orderable uh, SKU that they're going to sell to the community. Uh, we're not a standards body. Uh, we want to make sure that all of our specifications, in fact, have orderable SKUs, and those SKUs are available to all of our community members, uh, as well as SKUs that are also supported. So, again, that's one of our requirements, and we have a checklist to, to make sure that that's, that that's done, that's completed. When they do that, we then actually uh, assign a logo or a certification mark, and we call that an OCP accepted product. It's recognized as OCP accepted. It truly is an open product. We have an open specification and we have an open design file and all of the information is available to a community member. In some cases, 
we have suppliers that would like to build a product in accordance with a previously accepted specification but they uh, they don't feel comfortable opening up the design this itself and so they can build the product they can submit that product uh, for recognition to the foundation uh, they again it has to be an orderable product it has to be a supported SKU available to the community again there's some uh, licensing uh, uh, information that's and, and licensing that's signed off uh, with the foundation we cover that through a checklist and that product then gets recognized as being OCP inspired so an OCP inspired product uh, at this logo meets the requirements of a previously accepted spec but it's not open in the true sense because there's not a complete design package that's available. We have a, a list of requirements uh, that go along with that OCP accepted classification. So this applies to specifications and design. So first off, we expect that the product uh, does have an orderable SKU that meets the requirements of that uh, specification. Um, we also have uh, tenants of open compute that we'll talk about in a few minutes. We want to make sure that that the product meets those tenants, three of the four tenants um, that we subscribe to around openness and efficiency. Um, we also uh, want to make sure that in the case of a specification or a design that there is a product that is forthcoming and will be available uh, in a reasonable time to the community. We actually um, changed this process in the last year to encourage contributors to share specifications and share the design as early as possible in their process so that our community was aware of products that are, that are in flight, in development, and may not be available today, but allows them to do two things. One is they're able to uh, talk with the spec author and add features into that spec that they absolutely need. It allows them to become a, a, a consumer of that product in, in many cases. Also allows um, the, the suppliers to see uh, what's coming and, and, uh, and have them, let them have the option of, uh, of building a product and becoming a supplier for uh, a, a spec that's in the pipeline. And then finally, we do require that new specifications and designs uh, go through approval process. Again, making sure that we have the checklist signed off. We have licenses in place. The membership requirements are met. And we actually go through a formal vote by the incubation committee. Once we have an approved specification and an approved design package, we then allow a product to become recognized as OCP accepted. And again, the product must follow the same, must meet three of the four tenets that we subscribe to. Um, there's a checklist associated with it. Uh, we actually ask that they provide engineering evidence that it does meet the, the tenets for efficiency and openness. Um, and again, we want to make sure that there's some orderable SKUs that, that are forthcoming. We want to also collect some information around the AVL and the collateral and tests that they're willing to share with us. And then assuming that they, where once they provide that information, then we actually go through a formal voting process and um, accept that product. That product then is recognized as, as being OCP accepted and it gets that certification mark. Our assurance then to our community is that you are in fact, when you buy a product that, that has received that OCP accepted recognition, you are in fact buying an open product and that there's a design package and a specification available for that. Build two examples if, if folks were looking um, at two really good examples of um, uh, specs and designs that release early, release often, like you mentioned, changing mm -hmm. the process yeah. earlier this year. If you go to uh, GitHub and look at the Open Compute Project GitHub uh, repository, we now have uh, Project Olympus by Microsoft. Um, that's yeah, that's, in that's there. a great example. And we have Barrel Eye. Great example. Microsoft Project Olympus was shared with this community many months ago. Uh, not only the, 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 the server product, but the rack design, their uh, power distribution scheme, uh, and the ingredients that go into that rack. That complete solution was shared on GitHub. Um, 
early preliminary specs have been shared with the community and that product has not gone to production yet uh, but but they are actively sharing that information and it allows the community to uh, first off it allows the community to provide feedback to the design team and that feedback process has allowed that design team to to make some modifications changes to their feature requirements changes to the design and it makes it more consumable uh, by this community and we expect to see uh, wonderful adoption when that product finally rolls out. We have a similar uh, contribution from Rackspace and, uh, and IBM. The, uh, they, the project was called Barrel Eye and that project uh, package, design package and specification was posted to GitHub. Let's see, I think it was probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Well, it was posted to community about two years was ago, it? but just recently posted to GitHub. Yeah, and following so, Microsoft's example. Exactly, and so the community had early access to the feature set, to some of the preliminary designs, the layout uh, that that uh, board and system uh, were, were were proposing, and then when that product did go to production, all of those design files, including source code for BIOS and firmware was posted to GitHub and, and so again a completely open design uh, for a product that is now in, in production and you can you know go to our uh, solution provider network and, and actually buy that. Uh, back to the slide we have uh, just a guideline to, that we share with the community as a suggestion on how to uh, go through this process. Again encouraging people to uh, create a draft specification, openly share that with the community through these monthly project team meetings and monthly get-togethers and certainly at the summit there'll be plenty of presentations that'll be shared. Um, again, seeking the uh, partnerships, seeking feedback and refining that product uh, so it's much easier to consume by a much broader audience. And then finally the third step being that they uh, actually go through the submission process and uh, and that they um, you know, and, th and they commit to have a product uh, that will come out uh, as being recognized as either OCP inspired uh, or OCP accepted. And again, the whole idea is that we want to get those, 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 that specification through the voting process accepted and show our commitment uh, to the community that, that this is a specification, it meets our approval, it meets our, our tenets as an organization, it's consistent with the the, 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 the direction that the IC and the board has set um, and allows our community, our suppliers and, and, uh, and consumers to, to align to those, those specifications. So again, just a guideline on, on how to use this, this process for accepted specifications. We also have the, the other category I mentioned, uh, OCP Inspired. Uh, this is, we use this with uh, products and again, uh, a specification must go through the acceptance process. So specification design packages are accepted only. Um, products can be either accepted or inspired. So in this case, we don't have a design package that's been submitted, but it does comply with a previously accepted specification. So again, uh, the key there, the key difference is that uh, there is not any IP associated with that design that has been transferred uh, to or assigned to the foundation. So the criteria for product to be recognized as OCP inspired is that uh, it, they have to be a, a member of, uh, in good standing, either silver, gold, or platinum member. Again, we still expect the product to meet the tenets of, of the foundation. We expect them to complete a checklist. Same expectations around orderable SKUs. Uh, we also want to make sure that that, that orderable SKU is actually supported and and, and warranty by the, the supplier. Uh, and we ask that they provide evidence that it does in fact meet the, the, uh, the specification uh, through the use of plug fest, test results, compatibility, or other engineering documentation. Um, and again, keep it in mind that we want to make sure that products are consumable and readily available. We set the expectation that uh, products that get this logo are available to our community within a reasonable amount of time. And, and today we set that at 120 20 days. So again, it allows our suppliers to announce that they have a product forthcoming. Uh, as long as they, there's some assurance that they're going to deliver in the next 120 days, then we will assign an OCP-inspired uh, recognition or classification certification 
to that product. Another diagram that shows uh, that contribution process, uh, back to the slide. Um, once we have an accepted specification, uh, we're, we're also in the process of putting together um, additional uh, types of information that we want to collect and share with, the, with this community. Um, first off, we want to uh, uh, gather uh, information about these orderable SKUs. We just talked about that. And then once we have that, that orderable SKU information, we also want to gather information about what was tested. And so uh, CPUs that are integrated onto server motherboards, um, storage devices, your, your commodities, your memory, uh, and your, your storage uh, commodities, we want to capture that information. Also want to know what enclosures it was tested with, what power supplies, um, if there was an operating system installed, or uh, BIOS or firmware installations that were updated. We'd like to know that information as well. Uh, and capture that as a tested configuration report. And again, make that available to the community so they have a starting point when they buy uh, this SKU in the marketplace that they'll know what's already been tested. Ideally, they can leverage that information uh, when they uh, go through their test and qualification process. And finally, we're actually encouraging uh, the community and, and in particular working with the, um, the OS and the ISV community to then uh, create uh, tested configurations where we take this, these orderable SKUs uh, with the uh, configured uh, commodities uh, installed on it and, uh, and put that together into a reference architecture. Uh, think of this as your full hardware or software solution stack. We want that to be built off of OCP accepted products, products that meet an OCP accepted specification. Um, and in doing so, we will, we will then publish reference architectures that are built upon or built off of OCP accepted um, uh, specs and products. And again, that's a 2017 activity. Uh, we actually have some project teams that are beginning to look at that. We're having meetings with the community and, and, uh, and our, uh, comp our, hard, our compatibility and interoperability group is, will be focused on that this year and understand how do we, how do we easily share that information um, and again, how do we leverage the, the, the capabilities that we have with our supplier network um, and our third-party test labs to, to perform some of this, in, this work. Um, we talked about the reference architecture. This is Again, I, I have a, a slide I'm sharing here to, in a moment um, that, that, that talks about the flowchart for that reference architecture. Again, built off of an OCP accepted SKU. We add the commodities into it to create a tested configuration. And then we go ahead and add in uh, application software, orchestration software. Uh, we may uh, use a set of utilities to configure that hardware or monitor it. Uh, and then ideally, we build up a rack solution using compute nodes, uh, uh, special purpose accelerators, uh, network switch gear or top of rack switches. We may have a, an aggregation layer uh, in the, the network. Um, we we'll, may have uh, a storage solutions built into that rack as well. And the combination of that hardware, software, utilities, uh, and applications then would, would create what we call as a reference architecture. We encourage uh, our ISV community to, uh, to document those reference architectures as well as encouraging them to use open hardware ingredients. In other words, ingredients that have already achieved the, the OCP accepted recognition. And in turn, uh, companies that are willing to share that reference architecture with our community will get some, uh, some credit uh, towards their membership and it can come in uh, many different forms. Uh, certainly comes in credit for the hours that, that, they, uh, um, that they provide. And so we have some matrices that, that we're sharing with that community on, on how to get, how to acquire hours that then contribute to their yearly membership. All that information is now available on a, our web portal. Uh, we went live with that at the beginning of the year and, and it's uh, I'll, I'll call it at, at alpha or beta level testing. Uh, we hope to have that uh, in full production uh, when we go to summit here in March of, of 2017. 
Um, and that today that will list all the orderable SKUs that a, the community can go out and buy. All of our specifications are also listed on that uh, web portal and you can actually search by keywords uh, to find those specifications. Um, in the future we're going to add tested, configura tested configuration information to that as well as add in uh, this reference architecture information. So all of our specifications, all of our design collateral, all of our AVL data, test data, reference architectures is available on our web portal for the community to, to get access, easy access to. I talked about the four tenets of open compute. I'm going to cover those in a little more detail. Those four tenets are efficiency, scale, openness, and impact. We, we don't want to adopt just any server or any storage device. We really want products that have been designed to improve efficiency. Um, and that means improve efficiency as measured by overall performance, uh, reduction of the infrastructure cost, maybe the pure uh, energy efficiency in the power conversion or power delivery chain. It could be uh, the, the leveraging uh, free cooling uh, technology or uh, uh, eco mode uh, technology in their data center. Uh, things that drive uh, overall efficiency in cloud operations. We expect our products to contribute in that area. We also expect our products to contribute in the area of scale. We want fast, simple, easy to maintain products. Uh, we want to uh, make sure that they, uh, that they adopt any management tools or management, hardware management practices that our uh, hardware management team is recommending. Um, and we also want to make sure that there's adequate documentation in place that allow these, this, these products to easily be easily to consume and again to scale out. Um, we are an open sourced uh, community and so we expect open products in terms of open source documentation. Uh, boards and systems that have interfaces, we expect those interfaces to be completely open and the engineering teams to define that openness and compatibility so that others can leverage those interfaces and design their products to work uh, with uh, the servers and, and, and storage and, and compute nodes that, that we've adopted uh, and, and networking gear. Um, and so wherever possible we want, it, we want to try to drive compatibility and interoperability with uh, already adopted uh, ingredients and, and SKUs and products and do that through well-defined open uh, interfaces and uh, compatible uh, testing. And then finally, we want to make sure that the products that we adopt uh, have an impact, that they have an impact in terms of, of uh, better efficiency, uh, that they're, we're driving new technology and allowing um, our consumers, our, our community to adopt that, that new technology um, much, much better. Uh, we want to empower the community to leverage uh, prior contributions and that's why we encourage these design packages. It allows uh, uh, others to innovate on top of an, an existing design and uh, turn that design uh, very, very quickly uh, for their own use as well as for uh, the community's use. And we look for um, efficiency in the supply chain as well. And we encourage our community to enable uh, the supply chain, not just one, but many uh, suppliers to design, to design uh, I'm sorry, and build products um, that meet their specifications. So again, these are the four OCP principles, also known as our four tenets, and all of the products and specifications that we uh, will accept must uh, meet at least three of those, and we expect the contributor to be able to um, articulate why their product or their specification meets three of, of these four tenets. However, if it meets all four, we want to know that it meets we all would, four. We would love to have it meet all four. We would encourage that. But we've drawn the bar this year at, let's say they got to meet three. Well, I know that we had a case where uh, a contribution actually met four of them, but they only wrote three of them down, and I think you pointed out. But it meets <laughs> this one, too. Can you just write that in That's as right. well? Very happy about that contribution. 
Let's uh, talk about the provider uh, program. You want to take that? Sure. So currently we have eight OCP providers, and, and those eight are uh, EdgeCore, Hive Solutions, Nokia, QCT, uh, uh, HP Enterprises, um, and I always butcher this one, so I'm not even going to try to uh, to say uh, the Techno Solutions Corporation, um, other name, because I will always get it wrong, Penguin and, and WeWin. And most of these, with the exception of EdgeCore, all offer full rack solutions, um, not just uh, uh, a component. EdgeCore um, is the networking um, component provider. And they just recently joined and became um, a, a provider. If you're interested in becoming an OCP provider, be it a component or a full rack solution, what you need to do is reach out to Steve Helvey at steve at opencompute.org and what you'll want to do is also make sure that you're an OCP member and then figure out what membership level uh, you would like. If you're only going to be contributing inspired uh, or you're only going to be asking that your products meet the inspired requirements, you're going to need to look at the silver, gold, or platinum level membership. If you're going to be contributing IP in the form of specifications and designs and you would like your product to be recognized as Open Compute accepted or OCP accepted, then you could look at anywhere from community all the way up to platinum and then um, you know the fees associated with both membership and um, the provider fee. And so it all depends on what you're wanting to do whether you're wanting to give your design files and you know whether you're wanting your contributions how you're wanting them to be recognized so it all depends on you and what you're willing to contribute um, and so we we anticipate many uh, more component providers coming in in 2017 this is new uh, in the past we only allowed full rack solutions and any um, any component, say you were just going to sell a rack or maybe you were just selling power or something like that, had to be um, approved at the board level um, because we really thought that promoting the full rack solution was the way to go. Now what we've learned over the past few years is folks want choice. They want to be able to see what all fits inside of a V1 rack or a V2 rack or the, the Microsoft uh, rack or the Rate Assist rack or the Barrel Eye. As you can see, we have many, and Bill's going to talk about some of these products in, in a little bit more detail. But depending on what you want, um, we now, one, are, have the ability to get, to give the community more choice, and, and two, give you as those who want to be a component or a solution provider, um, give you um, more options um, and lower the cost to buy in and be part of that program. And so with that, here's talk, some of the products that are offered. Let's talk about products. And again, we're going to touch on them very briefly uh, because our product portfolio is changing. It's very dynamic. Uh, like, like we said earlier, we had, what, 170? 140. Uh, 140 active SKUs right now and another 30 or 40 that were just retired. Yep. So again, it's it's a very active product portfolio. Um, what we have learned over the last four or five years as an organization is that although the, uh, the outside of a rack or outside of the IT equipment um, may look quite different from a mechanical or power delivery perspective, um, the inside is fun fundamentally the same. You have network, compute, storage, and uh, connectivity. And with that, we recognize that we want to focus on building uh, a, a, a portfolio of common ingredients or building blocks. Uh, some of those building blocks support the, the framework, the mechanical framework or power uh, delivery framework, and some of those support uh, the IT uh, functionality, the storage, switch gear, and, and compute. Um, and wherever possible, we're willing to trade off uh, differences in a server enclosure or rack mechanical because it represents one uh, in the overall cost of things it represents the lowest acquisition cost and in most cases it also represents the lowest engineering investment when you have to redo a server enclosure or a rack mechanical whereas uh, qualification of a compute board or a top of rack switch or storage devices 
typically represent one, higher acquisition cost and more engineering resources uh, when you do the qualification, port your application onto it, uh, and then install that um, into your data center. Uh, so wherever possible, uh, use common ingredients around uh, the storage switchgear and, and compute nodes, and uh, adopt, when we need to, adopt different framework to fit into different data center requirements. Um, so if you, if you look at that from a pictorial perspective, uh, we do have a couple different rack options. I'll talk about those uh, very briefly here in a minute. But again, the concept is let's focus on core ingredients. Let's make sure that we can use those core ingredients in uh, whatever uh, physical architecture that our customers choose to implement. In many cases, that physical architecture is driven by um, some requirements that are placed on, on them by their facility, their, uh, the region in which they operate, their, uh, their, their cooling or, or power um, delivery uh, limitations in, the, in their um, data center. So the first rack architecture that the foundation supports is open rack. This is the original uh, contribution from Facebook. Um, this is a, uh, a, a, a takes an IT a shelf that's much wider than the traditional IT equipment. We accept uh, IT equipment that's 538 millimeters wide, that's roughly uh, 21 inches, and it uses a spacing that's a little different than your traditional uh, EIA rack. It uses a spacing that's on 48 millimeters. So our IT shelf is a little wider and slightly taller than the more traditional IT equipment. Now this allows you to put three compute nodes uh, uh, next to each other, and so it changes the uh, compute density slightly. It also allows a larger frontal area, and there's some advantages from a cooling perspective uh, when you match up this design um, with an efficient uh, data center design. The, the, the nice thing about it is it fits on the same uh, layout in your data center. So uh, the, the floor tile in your data center is typically 600 millimeter uh, square tile, and so this rack fits on one tile wide by two tiles deep, or 600 millimeters wide by 1200 millimeter deep. And again, it fits the, well within uh, the existing uh, data center. Um, for efficiency, it uses a 12 volt, uh, uh, sh 12 volt shared power. It's shared via uh, bus bars across the back, and the power comes from uh, either a single or, or multiple uh, rectifiers that are installed into the rack and then provide this 12 volt DC power up these bus bars. We have a couple different options there. You can have a, a bus bar that uh, where we have actually three a pair of bus bar that run up the back and each of these compute sleds uh, hot plug directly into the bus bar. We also have an option where you reduce the cost of the bus bar or the rack by using a single bus bar um, and then you have uh, some distribution cables that are uh, built into the enclosure. So again, it gives some flexibility uh, within the same basic style of rack. Um, recently, uh, we had a, a new partner join in uh, 2015. Um, they, when they joined the foundation, uh, they brought with them some uh, technology and IP that were, they were willing to share. And we added into this open rack spec the option for 48 volt uh, DC distribution as well as 48 volt uh, rectifiers and 48 volt uh, battery backup units that are, are installed right into the rack and thus eliminating the need for a UPS in your facility. So again, these are all options uh, built off of the open rack standard that we adopted back in, in 2011. One thing to note is we also have a convertible option that's available from one of our suppliers. Uh, this was actually a contribution from Fidelity Investments. Uh, they loved the idea of this open rack uh, frame, um, but they also recognized that that they had to that they wanted to maintain some backwards compatibility uh, through this transition period. And so, working with the suppliers and the community, they came up with a con what they called was a convertible rack, and it actually allows the the frame, the IT frame, uh, to be quickly reconfigured. So that particular rack can support both the, your traditional 19-inch EIA equipment as well as this new IT 
uh, shelf size, it's 538 by, by 48 millimeters. So we call that the open rack spec. Lots of products uh, designed and, and built and, and available for, for open rack. We also have a new variant that we uh, adopted in uh, Q4 of, of 16. Um, we called it's a variant on open rack. Uh, it is designed for deployment into the central office. And so we called it the carrier grade or CG open rack 19. So the 19 stood for the 19 inch EIA frame. So again, it's similar to open rack in that we have a shared uh, power solution. It's distributed via 12 volt uh, bus bars across the back. Sleds are hot plug, uh, hot plug blind mated into um, the rack. Again, you have uh, full and half width sled options uh, that are designed into it. But again, it picked up some carrier grade features into the rack in terms of, of earthquake protection, uh, some power, um, uh, EMC uh, uh, robustness, um, and just some other requirements that the central office placed on IT equipment that was installed into that. The other unique feature is that on the back of every one of these sleds is a blind mate hot plug optical network connection. There's actually four uh, network ports uh, that are that are as part of this uh, 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 connector block, and so um, and th those feed into uh, the, the top of rack switch, and it allows each of those compute nodes to be managed through functionality built into the to top of rack switch. This rack standard was adopted, like I said, in Q4 of uh, 2016, and we're now starting to see um, uh, additional suppliers uh, come forth with additional products that are designed uh, to work in the CG Open Rack 19 and expect to see some um, new uh, concepts and product ideas come out at the summit this year. Our third uh, standard is Microsoft's uh, project Olympus rack design. Um, again, uh, a wonderful option for the community uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, it, it allows uh, backwards compatibility with the 19-inch EIA frame. Uh, Microsoft learned from their worldwide deployments into literally hundreds of different data centers um, that there was some advantage to have some compatibility uh, with the existing uh, IT equipment in those data centers. Um, and actually, they learned that, that one of the challenges to work with a lot of different data centers around the world is that the AC uh, distribution schemes that were, it, that were built into these data centers were quite different, and they needed to support a really wide variety of AC inputs. And so they designed a, 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 a universal PDU uh, that you see in the pictorial there. And this, uh, this PDU actually has several different adapters that allow the PDU to connect into the data center's um, AC power distribution scheme. This uh, PDU supports a couple of different uh, power resiliency options so that you can have an A and B feed for, for resiliency, as well as support a single and uh, three-phase uh, power input. The other unique uh, uh, feature of uh, Microsoft's Project Olympus is that they designed a very unique rectifier that, that allows phase balancing. So regardless of, um, of what phase, I'm sorry, regardless of whether you have single or, or three phase power, that you have a single rectifier that is going to provide your A and B side switching as well as provide uh, current sharing across all three phases. The server uh, network uh, storage nodes uh, are all hot plug blind mate sleds uh, serviceable from the front. Um, and the other thing that's very unique about this is that um, all of these components have uh, achieved uh, worldwide recognition in terms of, of EMI or EMC uh, regulatory requirements, safety certifications. And so uh, in some cases, uh, data center operators require that you have an FCC or uh, uh, an EMI UL safety logo or safety recognition on the component you're installing. And so um, Microsoft's Project Olympus gives us a solution now for data center operators that, that have that requirement. Um, they've also gone through and enabled an a, a open supply chain 
uh, for the community and so we have a again a, a, a many choices in terms of, of how to source um, all of these ingredients and the advantage here is that we now have uh, an ability for our community to source ingredients from the same suppliers that Microsoft is sourcing uh, for their own data center so that is Microsoft's project Olympus and with that we have completed our presentation uh, I think we probably used all 80 minutes minutes of it I uh, just wanted to say thank you for hanging in with us. Thank you for listening to uh, OCP 101. And if you have any questions, I think we gave you a couple of contact names. Uh, please reach out and, uh, and talk to us. We would love to have you uh, uh, participate with our, our open hardware community. Anything to add, Amber? Just that your email address is, <laughs> is bill at opencompute.org, and I'm amber at opencompute.org. And we would love to hear from you. If you have any questions around the contribution process, Bill's your man. Membership, yeah, licensing, your woman. I'm the woman <laughs> for all that. So, again, thank you so much, and we look forward to hearing from you and seeing your contributions. Thank you.